Can fate be escaped? If the future isn't fixed, if steps can be taken to change it, can this really be called fate? I'm Rem Woodcraft, and this is Fiction Briefly. People have been asking this question for centuries, and it can be fun to speculate on one's own innate potential. But what if the result of knowing one's fate plays a role in its coming to fruition? I give you Oedipus. One of the most enduring heroes from Greek myth, Oedipus, shares a commonality with Judas and other characters given away at birth who are doomed to sleep with their own mothers. His story took over psychology in the form of the Oedipus Complex. This Freudian theory from the 1899 book The Interpretation of Dreams proposes that all boys go through a stage where they wish to possess their mothers and kill their fathers. As Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis involved the study of patient dreams, he found many who suffered from the same fantasy. He felt inspired by the line in Sophocles' play Oedipus the King when Jocasta says, many men have slept with their mothers in their dreams, and the theory gained its name. But unlike Freud's patients, Oedipus did not know Jocasta was his mother, and his story is not a dream. He fathers four children with his mother, though both he and his father were warned separately. As Freud's theory deals with the subconscious, things out of our conscious control, could it be said that humans are resigned to fate, that our thoughts are not our own? It seems the belief in prophecy and a fixed fate had lost popularity among the Greeks in Sophocles' time, and some favored the worship of the new goddess of chance over the old gods like Apollo. Jocasta and Oedipus are two of these people. Jocasta says no mortal can practice the art of prophecy, no man can see the future. She neither believes the words of Apollo's priests who warned Oedipus' father, King Laius, nor the words of Tiresias, a local prophet of Apollo called on by Oedipus. But even as the story unfolds, it seems these prophets are the cause of Oedipus' marriage to his mother. Laius gives away his infant son to die because of the warnings of the priests. Then a shepherd saves the baby's life. Oedipus leaves Corinth because of the warning of the oracle. And Tiresias, with his ability to see the true identity of Oedipus, could have come forward before Oedipus marries his mother. For the origin story of Oedipus, again I'll refer to Otto Rank's work, The Myth of the Birth of the Hero, even though we'll focus on the hero's downfall. First, the hero is born of royal or supernatural parents. Oedipus is the son of King Laius and Queen Jocasta of Thebes. Difficulties precede the hero's conception, or the mother is a virgin. Jocasta has difficulty getting pregnant until Apollo's priests prophesies that Laius' son will kill him. After that, he avoids sexual relations until one drunken night. Of course she gets pregnant. The child loses or is taken away from his parents. Jocasta gives Oedipus to Laius' shepherd to be disposed of on the order of King Laius. He is to be left to die in the Kitharon mountain range. The child is rescued by animals or shepherds. Laius' shepherd gives Oedipus to King Polybus' shepherd. Oedipus is then raised by the king and queen of Corinth. The hero is identifiable by a mark or wound. Oedipus has his ankles bound together through the skin between the tendon and the bone, leaving a lifelong injury. The hero reconciles with a father's representative, or he takes revenge on his father. Oedipus kills Laius when they meet on the crossroads between Delphi and Daulis. As with the hero's journey in Star Wars, I reference Vladimir Propp's morphology of the folktale for the origin story of Oedipus, pieced together in part from Sophocles' Oedipus the King, written between 429 and 425 BCE, and Otto Rank's The Myth of the Birth of the Hero, published in 1909. The following represents the chronological order of events taken from both sources. Hopefully, you will also see why Sophocles started his story where he did within the hero's journey. 
In writing a tragedy, he skips the part where Oedipus becomes the hero of Thebes and focuses on the part where he falls to ruin. The audience in his time would have known the particulars of the story already, having heard other versions. What they are interested in is Sophocles' unique philosophical take, his focus on fate written with moving and memorable lines. First in the formula lies absentation. A member of the family leaves home. Oedipus seeks out the oracle at Delphi to find out the truth of his birth. After absentation comes the interdiction, where the hero is told to avoid a person or a place. Oedipus must avoid his mother and father, whom he believes are King Polybus and Queen Parabia of Corinth. Next is villainy or lack. Oedipus lacks the truth of his origins. This lack drives the story. Now we arrive at the struggle, where the hero and villain fight. Meeting a man and his entourage on the way from Corinth to Thebes, Oedipus is run off the road. The hero then experiences victory, where the villain is defeated. In a struggle with the men, Oedipus kills them all. At this point, of course, he does not realize he has killed his father, King Laius. But has he? A later account from one of his subjects, formerly part of Laius's entourage, claims to be a witness to the scuffle, whereas Oedipus leaves no survivors. Here I'll also include an aside from the hero's journey in Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. He includes the meeting of a goddess who can be good or evil, and in this case, the Sphinx is evil. Tormenting the city of Thebes, she promises to free the citizens from harm if anyone can answer her riddles. As Laius has not returned to his kingdom, Jocasta's hand in marriage is offered as additional incentive. The Sphinx asks her riddle, and Oedipus answers correctly. The Sphinx kills herself by throwing herself into the ocean. Continuing with Prop's formula, we arrive at the return where the hero goes home. Oedipus arrives in Thebes, not knowing this is where he was born. Prop includes a stage called the Unrecognized Arrival. This is where Oedipus arrives in Thebes without his true identity as son of Laius and Jocasta known. The hero encounters a difficult task. Things go well for a while until Thebes is threatened by another plague. This is the opening of the play Oedipus the King. Oedipus is known as the savior to the people of Thebes. The priest of Zeus says Oedipus is more like a god than any man alive. But in this play, we don't see a wise and noble ruler. We see a petty, angry man at his wit's end. Oedipus and his brother-in-law, Creon, discuss the reason for the plague as the unsolved murder of the former king, Laius. To solve the mystery, Oedipus calls for the seer, Tiresias, who says, Wisdom is a curse when wisdom does nothing for the man who has it. Tiresias knows King Oedipus is the reason for the plague, and at first refuses to tell him. And when he does, Oedipus gets full of insults and paranoia. There's some rich foreshadowing when Tiresias says, I pity you for mocking my blindness. Soon everyone in Thebes will mock you, Oedipus. Oedipus thinks brother-in-law Creon has turned against him and is trying to get his throne but he hasn't heard the worst of Tiresias' news. According to the seer, Oedipus is the killer of King Laius, his father, and he is husband of Jocasta, his mother. Despite knowing the oracle's prophecy of this very thing, Oedipus quickly turns against Creon, proposing his banishment or death for influencing the words of Tiresias. It's not until the hero is recognized, another step in Prop's formula, that Oedipus becomes convinced. A shepherd from Corinth identifies Oedipus as the baby he gave to King Polybus, identified by the scars on his ankles that were used to bind his feet together as an infant. Jocasta's reaction confirms the awful truth. Upset, she runs inside the palace. The final step in Prop's formula is Transfiguration, where the hero gains a new appearance. After grabbing a sword and looking for her in anger, Oedipus finds Jocasta hanging from the rafters. 
Unable to stand the shame of having fathered four children with his own mother, he takes the brooches off of her outfit and stabs himself in the eyes. Now as blind as Tiresias, Oedipus has fallen victim to his preordained destiny. The Greeks knew how to do tragedy. What can be more disturbing than accidentally fathering children with one's mother? And this was a story for children! When people talk about Oedipus the king, they inevitably breach the subject of an unchangeable fate. Could Oedipus do anything to escape this fate? Can he be said to have free will and therefore blamed for his murderous outrage on the road to Thebes? Or is the murderous rage a tragic flaw he was born with that he couldn't overcome? Regarding the concept of free will, French philosopher Louis Althusser wrote that we live under an illusion that permeates everything we do. The most pervasive illusion is that of individual freedom. Our lives are partially determined by our birth, our environments, and our opportunities, but we are also bombarded by political, religious, and consumerist ideologies making our thoughts and actions the thoughts and actions of others. Think of the pressure to buy the latest technological product. Your old one works fine, except for a couple of glitches that could be repaired, but you don't want to be left behind. You want to be at the forefront of progress. This is just one aspect of consumerism. Certainly there are choices presented which individuals can act upon, but the external pressure and internal makeup to follow one path or another have more weight than most realize. As a society, we may no longer believe in fate the way ancient Greeks did, but to an extent our destinies are still determined by factors out of our control. I contend that the play Oedipus the King has a strong case for the existence of fate, but shows that the gods are pretty messed up. Oedipus is told King Polybus and Queen Parabia are not his real parents even before he leaves Corinth. That's why he goes to the Oracle in the first place. If he is as clever as the play suggests, he would steer clear of any older woman for a wife, realizing that Queen Parabia is not his mother. It's partially his trust in the prophecy which does him in. If knowing their fate caused them to take actions they normally wouldn't have, the gods are just cruel. But then, we knew that already. Greek myths are full of these types of philosophical debates that keep them relevant. And as you'll see in subsequent shows, we can't escape the Greeks. Their gods and mythic themes show up all over in modern culture. Next time, I'll analyze the origin story of Neo from The Matrix and his connection to Greek myth through Morpheus. Again, we'll follow the familiar formula which created yet another blockbuster. You can comment on this episode or suggest new content on my Facebook page, Fiction Briefly. Thanks to Kestrel and Mexican Spy Company for all music and sound production for this show. Again, this has been Fiction Briefly, giving you a glimpse into the mind of an artist. Thanks for listening.